Let me tell you about my Uber driver. It was just a short 15-minute drive home. I was being responsible after having won too many cocktails on my third date from Tinder. I didn't quite feel comfortable enough with him driving me home because, you know, you hear all those horror stories. Everyone uses you, Barrett, was a safe service. That is what I thought anyway. In fact, this was my first time in using the app. I have had to snag a ride through the service a few times before. I knew the drill. I was scared. I just wanted to get home. I'm not trying to scare you by telling you my story. I'm trying to warn you. My app dinged with the name Joe. I love that they let you know the name of the person picking you up. It makes you feel like you have a sense of familiarity with the person. I open the front door passenger seat to hop in like I normally do when it's just me. The driver, Joe, acted nervous and told me to sit in the back seat, which I thought was strange. I shrugged it off. I jumped in the back, buckled up, and we set off to my destination. Six water bottles were placed in a cooler pack in the middle seat, along with a tray of snacks consisting of granola bars, Jolly Ranchers, and goldfish. I loved when the drivers did this. I was going to give him five stars, especially after a night of drinking. Those water bottles were a godsend. I dug through the pile of snacks and plopped a blue Jolly Rancher in my mouth. Hey, Joe, do you have any good tunes? He didn't respond. Surely he heard me, or maybe I was drunk and slurringy piped up again, this time louder after clearing my throat. Joe, excuse me. He looked at me through the rearview mirror. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he proceeded to turn on the radio. A country song that's overplayed squeaked through the speakers, but Joe was acting fidgety, so I figured I'd just ride this out. It wouldn't be too much longer till I was home. After a few minutes of awkward silence, Joe finally began to speak up. You been drinking tonight? I twiddled my thumbs and looked out the side window. I was so tired and just wanted to curl up in my bed. I replied with a solemn, just a few drinks. He shifted in his seat and kept creeping his eyes up to the rearview mirror. One hand was on the steering wheel as he kept us steady on the road. I could tell that he was trying to catch glimpses of me without me noticing. He spoke up again. This time a grin spread across his face. What all did you drink tonight? Bored with the dragging of the rye, I figured this was innocent small talk. A little different from what other drivers would choose to talk about, yes, but still innocent. I had a tequila sunrise, an old-fashioned, and a few glasses of champagne. He sat up in his seat, one arm still on the wheel. Those deep brown eyes kept flickering at me in the rearview mirror, almost every couple of seconds. He started to pry, you drink tequila often. I casually replied while I kept my eyes out the window, sometimes. Just depends on my mood. He chuckled, you drunk tonight. This is what made me feel uncomfortable. Obviously, I didn't want to drive home myself, so one could assume that I was at best tipsy. Why was he questioning my level of coherence? I kept my eyes focused out the window because I was getting creeped out by the accidental eye contact we were making through the rearview mirror. Oh no, just a little buzzed. He kept a tight-lipped smile, then spoke. You want to be drunk, though? I have a bottle of tequila back there. I stared down at my phone. Just five more minutes till I was home. Um, no thanks, I'm actually good. He had both hands on the steering wheel now. He was gripping it tight and rubbing his hands against the leather. This nervous feeling rose in my gut, 
and I know that they say to never ignore your gut feelings, but I was already in the car with this guy. I was a few minutes from my house. What was I supposed to do? I sat there and kept my eyes glued to the window. Perhaps, if I didn't show any interest in conversing with him, he would just get me home without suggesting anything inappropriate. Whatever I was doing seemed to be working, because he changed his tune through his next response. So you're done partying for the night, huh? Responsible, I let out a short chuckle and agreed with him. I was being responsible, he piped up again this time, more friendly than before and less interrogating. Well, help yourself to a water, I have plenty. My heart started to slow, and I realized that he was just trying to earn that five-star review by being accommodating. Maybe he is just trying to be nice. He has all these snacks and drinks in his car, and free alcohol. Maybe he was trying to get his Uber score up. Maybe he has a family at home who he is trying to provide for. Was I being too judgmental? I silently scolded myself for the intrusive thoughts. I grabbed the water bottle, twisted the lid off, and took a couple gulps. I saw the turn for my street ahead, and a rush of relief washed over Methodist until he passed it. That's right, he completely passed my street. I sat up in my seat, screwed the lid back on the water bottle, and spoke up. Oh, that was my street you just passed. Nothing. Silence. Again, I spoke up, louder this time since my driver seemed to have a hearing problem. You passed my street. One deadpan answer from him made my heart jump into my throat. I know. I put my foot down this time. I need you to turn around. My house is back before I could finish my sentence. He interrupted me. Shut the fuck up, you little whore. I sank back in my seat as panic set in. I still had my phone in hand. I could call for help still. This calmed me down until he slammed the brakes on. Spit hit the dash as he screamed. Damn it. The good thing is that I had my seat belt on or I surely would have slammed into the glass. The sudden brake flung my phone from my hands. I could still see the light of it, though. It had slid underneath his seat. He did a donut on the street, then started to speed in the opposite direction we were just driving in. My voice was shaking, and I'll admit I was beginning to freak out. What is going on? What are yadoing, headed and dancer? He kept driving faster. Sweat broke down the nape of his neck. Again, I tried to muster up the strength to grab my phone from under the seat when a wave of exhaustion hit me. What was going on? Things began to get blurry, and I knew I needed to grab that phone. I tried to keep my eyes open and my body balanced. Where was he taking me? Why was I feeling sod of it? I didn't need to ponder his actions for too long because I saw what he was speeding from red and blue flashing lights. It didn't take long before the car was swerving in all directions off the road, which I later found out was the result of a spike strip strategically placed on the road. All of this was a haze, and I passed out a few seconds after my body started flail around the back seat. I, of course, had a dozen questions after the initial shock of everything wore off. I'm still in shock from everything and almost can't even believe what the authorities have told me. They told me I dodged a bullet. They told me I must have had a guardian angel looking after me. The shocking part was that my Uber driver was actually an Uber drive at all. Joe, poor Uber driver, Joe was murdered long before was picked up. The guy that had been driving me, which I later discovered his actual name was Trevor Crop, had murdered Joe after being picked up.
Joe had been dead for 18 hours, leaving Trevor a trail of five different girls to be picked up under the guise of Joe. All five girls were brutally murdered by the hands of Trevor. By the time he had picked me up, the authorities had caught on. They were able to trace the GPS attached to Joe's Uber app, which is how they were able to trap Trevor the way they did. I don't know what or who tipped the authorities off, but I'm so thankful that the game of cat and mouse ended with me safe and sound. I feel horrible for those girls that didn't make it, and I can't even comprehend how scared they must have felt. The true weight of the situation was revealed when I turned on the news the next morning. The headline story talked about the five girls who were murdered, but the description of how they were found is what made my stomach heave in disgust. All five girls had rufalin in their system. They found that there was a high quantity of the drug in a tequila bottle found in the car. Also, six bottles of water found in the back seat to teach at high levels of the drug. That's right, the water bottle that I drank from. That explains why I became so out of it. Again, I thought I was being responsible. Little did I know. Each girl had their ears, nose, and lips cut off. Based on blood analysis, the girls were alive during this. They were then brutally raped and left naked in a ditch to bleed out. It still haunts me to think about what would have became of my situation if the authorities hadn't found us. I'd be mutilated in a ditch right now. Like they said, I dodged a bullet. All in the name of responsibility. For now, I am just thanking my lucky stars that there were several good people that saved my life from one bad person. As far as Uber goes, I'm not saying they are to blame. They are a great service that you should still use. In fact, you'd probably get in more trouble driving drunk than having something like my story happen to you. Just be careful Joe pulled all the different plays with me. He tried the party girl attempt which didn't work. He outsmarted me. He took the friendly, nice guy approach. I drank his little concoction thinking it was just plain water. Like I said before, and not trying to scare you wing trying to warn you. This is the important takeaway from my story. There are bad and good people everywhere. It is your job to be aware of your surroundings, and if something feels off, believe it. I know I will think twice before trusting a stranger, regardless of the circumstance. Story 2. Am an Uber driver, and one of my passengers invited me into their home. There are a lot of things I don't understand about this world. A lot of things that don't make sense to me or I simply can't make sense of. I don't exactly have a philosophical outlook on the universe, what our purpose is and all that. But what I saw that night left me asking questions I never thought I'd want to ask. I've seen a lot of things as an Uber driver questionable things, even. That's just a part of the job description. It's an interesting experience, to say the least. But hey, it puts food on the table. I have two kids that I need to take care of, and their father is no longer in the picture. I'm rarely ever home because I'm constantly working to make ends meet. I work as a teacher during the day and would drive for Uber as soon as the school day ended. I try to accept as many rides as I can for as long as I can. I wish I never accepted that last ride. It was around 10 p.m. when I got the notification for a booking. The drop-off location struck me as odd, but I didn't think much of it at the time. It was quite a ways from the city, and I didn't think people even lived in that area. The fare was a considerably large amount, so I decided I could make this my last ride and get home a bit earlier than usual. 
I was just by the pickup location, so I was able to get there in under five minutes. A tall, slender woman settled herself in the back seat. She was gorgeous, short brown hair, impossibly perfect bone structure, and the brightest green eyes I'd ever seen on a human being. She looked to be in her mid-twenties. I greeted the woman as she entered the car. Good evening, Lauren. Right, yes, dot, and you, dear Yasmin, yes, she asked me in a tone that sounded far beyond her ears. I'm sorry, your name, dear. My passengers rarely asked me for my name. They usually just got in and stared at their phones for the entire ride. I guess she was just trying to be nice and make conversation. Yes, nice to meet you. Likewise, Yasmin, she responded. It was quiet for a few minutes as we drove to our destination. She spoke up again a few times and asked me about my life, what I did for a living, my family, my hobbies, etc. Then she asked me about my kids. Is your husband watching them right now? Ah, no, my cousin babysits them until I get home, which is nocturnal, so she doesn't mind the late nights. How nice of her. I was starting to get a strange feeling about Lauren. It was odd to me that she was asking me about my kids in the way that she was. My passengers didn't normally converse with me, and when they did, they would mostly talk about themselves. Then again, I could have just been overthinking that, or it was from the burrito I had that morning. Grumble, definitely the burrito, as I started to feel more uncomfortable with my bowel situation. I checked the map to see if there were any gas stations near the drop-off location. I couldn't find any which was unsurprising. There was no way I could hold it until I got back to the city. Grumble. As much as Lauren creeped me out, I couldn't just shit my pants, so I mustered up all my courage and asked her, Uh, Lauren? This might be an extremely unusual request, but would it be all right if I used your restroom? Of course, dear, that would be no problem at all. She replied, I was looking at her through the rearview mirror and thought I saw her right eye twitch. Must have been my imagination. Wet arrived at a seemingly average suburban house, the kind with a white picket fence and a well-maintained front lawn. Nothing out of the ordinary. Thank you for the rye. Yasmin, shall we? Lauren asked me as she exited the car. I followed suit and accompanied her to the front door. We're actually having a small get-together at the moment, she said to me and spun around to ring the doorbell before I could respond. A young woman had answered the door again. Very attractive, man. What do these people eat? She had similar features to Lauren which lead me to believe they were sisters. They had the same brown hair and green eyes. Oh, hello, the young woman greeted us. Rose, this is Yasmin. She's here to use our restroom. Lauren explained, Yasmin, this is Rose, my younger sister. Nice to meet you. Sorry for the intrusion. I apologized. No apologies necessary, dear. Come, let me show you the way, Rose said as she took my hand and led me inside. We're actually having a small get-together at the moment. That was eerie. The way they spoke was nearly identical. Rose even said the exact same thing Lauren did. And the way Rose called me dear, when I was probably a decade older than her. When we went through the dining room, I saw their small get-together. There were at least ten other people in the dining room. They all had the same brown hair and bright green eyes, even if they were all related. It was strange how even the shade of brown and green remained consistent. 
I felt a chill run down my spine the way they were all just sitting there, staring at the food in front of them. Perhaps they had been waiting for Lauren to arrive, but it was still a disturbing sight to see. I couldn't help but breathe a sigh of relief when we exited the dining room, partly because, what the fuck, and how I was seriously about to shit myself. Here we are. Please let me know if you require any further assistance. They'll be in the dining room, Rose said as she walked away. Thanks, I called after her. I shut the door and was finally able to relieve myself. I checked my phone to see if I received any messages from my cousin, Samantha. Wednesday, 8, 13 p.m. Samantha. Hey, Yas, successfully put the kids to bed. Wednesday, 10, 47 p.m. Me. Thanks, Sam. And just making a quick pit stop and they'll be headed home soon. Samantha. All good. Take your time in just watching some TV. Me. All righty. He'll call you when I'm on the way. Samantha. Okay. Stay safe. I pulled my pants back on after cleaning myself and then flushed the toilet. As I washed my hands, I noticed something off about the mirror. It seemed as if it was a part of the wall. That kind of made the alarms in my head go off. I read about this somewhere. I needed to confirm my suspicions, so I placed my finger on the mirror. There was no gap. It was a two-way mirror. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard a knock on the door. Yasmin, is everything all right in there? I heard Rose ask me from the other side of the door. Why yet? Sorry, be out in a sec, I told her. I looked away so that my back was facing the mirror and shot Samantha a text message. I told her to call me if I did get to call her first within the next fifteen minutes. I put my phone back in my pocket and walked out into the hallway where Rose was waiting. We were wondering if you would like to join us. She smiled at me. It was unsettling, as if she was up to something. It was like I could almost see it in her eyes, something behind them that I couldn't explain. I felt conflicted, like I wanted to get the hell out of there, but I was also extremely curious. No, I shouldn't I have to get home? It's getting late, I reply. It'll just be for a bit, she said as she took my hand once again and led me toward the dining room. The only empty seats were beside Lauren, so I decided to sit next to her. Rose took the other empty seat beside me. I noticed a huge painting on the wall from across us. It was a painting of a handsome man with chestnut brown hair and eyes like evergreens and a forest. He looked inviting warm, almost like a familiar face in a room full of strangers which was impossible. Since I.D. never met him before, I just felt comfortable. I decided to ask about the man. Who's the guy in the painting? Oh, that's Father, Lauren answered eagerly. I can, huh? See the resemblance, I said awkwardly. You're too kind, dear, hissed she just lovely. Everyone I in the room nodded along and agreed with Lauren. Some of them even decided to throw in their own compliments. I was confused because my statement was fairly neutral. You should eat, dear, lest the food gets cold, the man who sat across me suggested. I looked at the plate in front of me. It was a relatively normal meal. Mashed potatoes, roast chicken, and some steamed vegetables. I looked at everyone else's plates and realized that they had been untouched. What about you guys? Aren't you gonna eat too? I asked hesitantly. Yes, of course. But we believe the guest should do the honor of starting us off. Another man stated. I took my fork and picked up a piece of chicken, but my phone rang, saved by the bell. 
am sorry, let me just take this phone call. You guys can eat ahead, I said as I started to get up. That won't be necessary, dear. We don't mind if you take the call here. Rose took my hand and gently pulled me to sit back down. Right? Okay, I muttered, then proceeded to answer Sam's phone call. Samantha, what's wrong? Where are you? It's getting late. Me. Hey, Sam. I'm so sorry. I might be home later than expected. Do you think you could stay a bit longer? Samantha, yas. Are you okay? You told me to call you in fifteen minutes. Me. No. It's all right. Make sure you put the lasagna in the fridge. Samantha. Yasmin. He hung up the phone and looked around. Everyone stayed silent as they watched me with their emerald eyes. Lasagna in the fridge was our code for trouble. I silently prayed that she had gotten that. You're such a good mother, Yasmin. Lauren remarked. Everybody else agreed and started fawning over me. Thank you was all I could say in return. I decided to focus on my food instead. I took a bite of the unassuming mashed potatoes and was pleasantly surprised. It was just the way I liked it, creamy and buttery with a few chunks in each bite. Wow, this is great, I blurted out without meaning to. Of course, dear, this is father's recipe. Everything he does is absolutely great, Rose said proudly. Yes, father does no wrong, the man across me agreed. I decided to try the chicken next. I could see why they liked this father guy so much. He had some really good recipes. I ended up eating everything on my plate. Everyone else finished all their food, too. I mean, who could blame them? Thank you so much for the lovely meal. I enjoyed it. But I really do have to get home to my kids now, I announced. I hope you still have room for dessert, Lauren said as she entered the dining room, holding a covered round plate. I didn't even notice her leave the room. I must have really enjoyed that meal. There was a voice in my head that kept trying to remind me that I really needed to get home, to get to my kids, to get away from this place. But once Lauren revealed the cake, all I wanted to do was eat it, and that terrified me. That fear went away as soon as I dug into my slice of cake. It was divine. I must have finished the whole thing in one bite. It was literally the perfect chocolate cake. Each layer was moist, yet still retained its fluffiness, and the chocolate canic was to die for. It's getting late, dear. Maybe you should stay the night, Rose suggested. No, I needed to get away from this place, and whatever the hell was going on here, I had to take my kids to school in the morning. Sam was waiting for me. She probably wanted to go home, too. That sounds like an absolutely great idea, dear, I responded. I had no idea why I said that. Rose's smile turned sinister, as if all the grace and innocence had left her face, like she had a mask on the entire time, and had finally revealed what was underneath. Her voice remained sweet when she said, I'm sure father would think the same way as well. She led me to the guest bedroom and said good night to me that she would see me in the morning, all the while having that menacing grin on her face. Once she shut the door, something snapped in me, as if I had just woken up. I checked my phone and saw that I had a dozen messages and a few missed calls from Samantha. One of her messages stated that she called the police and that they were on their way. I sighed in relief. Everything was probably going to be fine. The Uber app had the info of where my last drop-off location was, and the cops were going to arrive any minute. 
I decided to have a look around the bedroom while waiting. Maybe there was something I could use as a weapon in case they tried anything before the police arrived. On the wall behind the bed, there was another large painting of the man they called Father. I still felt the same way about him when I saw the first painting. I was almost sad this place was probably going to get busted and shut down or something. I looked at the wall across the bed, and there was a mirror that looked to be a part of the wall. Just as I was about to do the two-way mirror test again, I caught a glimpse of my reflection. What I saw made my blood run cold. My eyes, they were turning green. Story 3 I tipped my Uber driver $20. I hope it was enough. Not sure where to post this, but here goes. Last night I was working late, so I took advantage of my company's guaranteed ride home program for overtime works and called an Uber. I was initially surprised when my driver pulled up in an unexpectedly nice vehicle, a Mercedes GL 450. I don't Uber that much, but when I do I don't think I've ever gotten anything other than a Prius. This was next level. There was bottled water, chargers for every type of phone, and even some snacks. I actually checked my app to make sure I didn't request an Uber Select or something by accident. But it was just ordinary Uber X. I was thinking maybe I got lucky. The driver was an Asian girl. Chinese maybe, I know there is a stereotype that Westerners can't tell the age of Asians, but I honestly couldn't say if this woman was in her early 20s or early 50s. She had that timeless, fresh Asian look, like that actress from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. She was very pretty, but there was something anomalous about her and Uber driving and this car. Normally I don't make chit-chat with my Uber drivers, but it was a 45-minute ride home, and after half an hour in silence, the overall oddity of the situation eventually overcame my reluctance. This is a really great car I tried. The woman smiled, thanks, I like it too. I was racking my brain for a, a follow-up, but everything that popped into my head sounded like I was some kind of stalker. There was another few minutes of silence before I tried again. So how do you decide to be an Uber driver? Oh, it's kind of a long story. She responded. We have some time, I think. The woman looked at me in the rearview mirror. Her eyes were incredibly piercing, as if she was taking measure of my soul. Then she turned back to the road. Actually, originally my husband was an Uber driver. He was a professional driver in China, which was a high-status job working for government officials and high-profile foreign visitors. When we immigrated here, he got his commercial license and signed up with Uber. He drove Uber black and only had commercial clients. Business was good, and he bought this car for that. Oh, that's cool, I added. I wasn't sure where this was going, but when Uber got popular, there were more drivers, and then they introduced UberX. Then anyone could drive. You didn't need a commercial license or anything. You didn't have to be a professional driver at all. For a while it was still okay, but over time there were fewer and fewer requests for the high-end Ubers. He thought he could make it up in tips, but at first Uber didn't have tipping, and even when they added it, most people still didn't tip. No one cared about the quality of service or the professionalism. On top of not tipping, people were so disrespectful. They would get the car dirty, come in with their dirty shoes or reeking of cigarette smoke. And worst of all, people would downrate him for no reason. Just if they were having a bad day, or maybe they just didn't like Chinese, it was humiliating for him. 
his income kept going down until eventually he couldn't even pay for our house. We had to move into an apartment, and even then it was a struggle. Eventually, he was so ashamed that he took his own life. I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. I was wishing I had just kept my mouth shut. Luckily, we were almost home. That's really tragic. I'm so sorry for your loss. Since his passing, I've taken over for him, driving on his account. I go out of my to provide the best possible experience. And then if a passenger still gives me a bad rating or no tip, I remember them. I know where they live or where they work. And later, I make them pay what they did to my husband. I was still processing the full import of this when the car came to a stop in front of my house. Here you go, I hope you had a good trip. I thanked her and carefully exited the vehicle. As I entered my house, she drove away. My Uber app pinged in my pocket, asking me to rate my driver. My entire body went cold with fear. I gave her five stars and twenty dollars. I hope it was enough. Story four. I had the worst Uber ride of my life a few months ago. I sat in the passenger seat of the Uber, my life flashing before my eyes. This driver was a crazy person. There was no doubt in my mind about that. My friend Smilf Hunter and I had eaten a couple cannabis gummies and some acid while waiting for the car to arrive. This turned out to be a terrible idea. Now I felt like my heart might explode. There's lizard people in the bars, the woman with the frantic, racing eyes said. She said her name was Jenny. Physically, she only loped nineteen or twenty, but her eyes were ancient and haunted. Her hair was clumped and unwashed. Her blue eyes shone with some kind of lunatic gleam. Otherwise, she was fairly pretty with pale skin and high cheekbones. She looked very thin, however, as if she hadn't been eating much lately. They look like people sometimes, but they can take off their skin. They can change, Jenny continued. She drove forty miles an hour on the highway in the fast lane. An endless caravan of cars stretched behind us. People would try to merge into the middle lane and pass by, flipping us the bird or screaming profanity out their windows as they went. She decided to change lanes. I knew what was coming. It was bizarre and terrifying. I mentally steeled myself. She would flash the turn signal left and right, left and right, as quickly as she could. It didn't matter whether she was merging left or right. She would always just end up flicking it up and down. I asked her why she did this. She gave me a very logical answer. If the lizard people are following us, I don't want them to know where I'm going, she said, giving me a sly grin and a wink. After her trick with the blinkers, she just went for it, merging into the other lane, with a squealing of brakes and a cacophony of honking horns. Why not just as you using your blinker then, I asked, blinking slowly and trying to comprehend her logic. I saw car headlights inches away from me, and I repressed a very strong urge to scream because that is what they are expecting, she cried triumphantly, smiling wide, apparently not even realizing the absolute danger we were in. I seriously doubt any of them are following an Uber driver around, Smilfy said, his black eyes smoldering like coals. I gripped the armrest tightly, my knuckles white as Jenny did another lane change. I was tempted to have her just drop us off here and pay her, because I literally thought I might die at any moment, and not some LSD ego death where Spongle played in the background, while a feeling that this has all happened before pressed in on me. No, 
This was the real death, the wet one with crunching bones and total agony. The only problem was that we were on the highway, and there was another exit for at least ten miles. And I certainly didn't plan on walking down the breakdown lane, I sighed heavily. Smofy, who had eaten about five hits of some ice cream cone kid plotter I had gotten earlier, sounded like he might be hyperventilating in the back. He was a tough cookie, though. Smilf Hunter had done fourteen years in prison for a house he burned down with an old lady inside. The old woman got out, but her house was totally destroyed. Ironically, that house was next door to the house I grew up in. I remember the fire, being woken up as a small child and taken outside to see the dancing flames. He was about twenty years older than me, but we had some mutual friends in the local art circles, and I found him very interesting. I liked to have long conversations about life with him while we walked through the woods, but still, Smilf Hunter absolutely loved fire. Whenever we had a bonfire, he would stare into it for hours, seemingly entranced and hypnotized by the flickering tongues of flame. Hey, Coblin, Smilf Hunter said to me, how are you doing? Hasn't fully hit yet, I said, looking at my phone. It had only been about fifteen minutes since I had eaten the blotter. I had only eaten three hits, at least this time, so I was expecting it to take a while to kick in. When I ate fifteen or twenty hits of powerful acid at once, though it would kick in within a couple minutes, Smilf Hunter and I were heading to a party for New Year's Eve. Six kegs of beer supposedly awaited along with everything else. Imaginable from tanks of nitrous to lines of ketamine to chocolate hearts filled with magic mushrooms. What about you? I said, turning to Smelfy. His face seemed to melt slightly as the dark aura that always surrounded him whipped and sizzled like electricity. He shrugged a little. He said, Yeah, a little. Give it an hour. I remembered back to the last strong acid trip I had taken a few weeks prior. I had felt my heart chakra opening like a flower with a thousand differently colored petals. A sense of pure bliss had risen up through my spine and into my crown like a spiraling snake. I had seen lines of pure energy running across the land, the trees and plants dancing in the wind in their own secret language. But this acid trip would turn out to be hell on earth, and to this day, I still get nightmares every time I fall asleep thinking about it. We got off the highway, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Is this the way, I asked, confused. I was tripping hard now, dirty, abandoned buildings passed by. Rainbow-colored lights seemed to glisten and sparkle over their surface as the walls magnified and shrank in dancing waves. I wasn't from around here, and I didn't know the city. Neither did Smilfy, for that matter. Oh, yes, Jenny said enthusiastically. She didn't use a GPS or any sort of assistance at all, and that worried me slightly. However, her next comment worried me much more. Oh, my God, look. She pointed at an ancient-looking man laying on a pile of tattered cloth on the abandoned sidewalk. It's a lizard person. Right here. She pulled over and stopped the car. Ho, ho, I said, putting my hands up. I looked back at Smelfy. He sat ramrod straight in the back seat, as stiff as a statue. He smoothed his dark hair over his forehead, his light olive complexion seeming to turn pale. Jenny opened the driver's door and got out, the car still running and the headlights still on. I didn't see anyone else besides ourselves and the old man on the sidewalk. I found this odd even for a run-down and abandoned part of the city. Goblin, 
Smilfy said, his voice angry and slightly hissing. Is this a prank on your part in not finding it very humorous? He narrowed his eyes. I put up my hands. I did have a history of playing pranks, but I wouldn't have set this up. Bro, I swear to God, I have no fucking idea what's going on right now, I said. This lady is absolutely nuts, he sigh. Let's get out here, he said. Well, walk if we have to, or call another Uber. I have no idea where I am or if the party is closed or if she's even taking us the right direction. I protested, but yeah, we could try calling another Uber. Let's go tell Jenny, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Smilfy and I walked the cracked, dirty street towards where Jenny stood, bent over the old man. The old man appeared to be dead, his sightless eyes staring up at the sky, my breath caught in my throat. Oh shit, I said, Ish, has not dead, Jenny protested. They always do this during the metamorphosis. When they shed their human skin, they look totally dead. Their heartbeats and breathing even stop. But any moment now, she continued to stare intently down at the corpse. As I got closer, I could see his lips and fingernails had turned blue, his pupils dilated. He is definitely 100% dead, Smilfy said without emotion. Goblin, could I talk to you over here for a second? He pulled me to the side. We need to get out of here before the cops come, he whispered in a low voice, keeping eye contact. I noticed how patterns of reds and blues and yellows seemed to spiral around his body. The first true rising vibes of an acid frenzy had begun. I felt my pocket and a flat piece of tin foil. I had about five sheets or five hundred hits of the ice cream cone kid blotter, minus the eight massive hits I had cut out of it for me and Smilfy. Okay, let's just start walking, and well, I started to say it, but I never got to finish the thought. From behind me, I heard a disturbing, ripping sound. I spun around and saw Jenny quickly backpedaling away from the old man's corpse. His skin started to bulge as if he had rats burrowing in it. The bulges ran across his face and neck. He began to twitch randomly as blood streamed from his ears and nose and mouth. His legs started to kick as if pedaling an imaginary bike. His fists clenched and unclenched. Now, I had done a lot of psychedelics in my life by this point. I could always tell exactly what was part of the drug and what was not. I knew the auras and trails of light and ability to see chakras were all just a part of the LSD. And I also instantly knew that this was not. His skin started ripping away with a sound like tearing paper. Something much larger started to emerge from beneath a humanoid form. It had dark gray circles around lighter gray scales that ran all over its naked body. As it began to pull itself out of the tattered cloth and remnants of human flesh and skin, it turned its head and looked directly at me. Its eyes looked like cloudy white cataracts with something dark swimming underneath them. It had sharp white spikes a couple inches long running over its shoulders and the top of its back. Its teeth glistened in the street lights, sharp and predatory like the teeth of a lion. Gray claws emerged from its feet and hands. It took a long step towards Jenny. She continued to jabber and mumble. No, please, don't let the metamorphosis happen to me, too. I heard her whisper. Smilfy grabbed my arm and spun me around. Run? God damn it. He hissed. Get out of here. He started to pull me away, trying to sprint. But my feet felt like lead blocks. What about Jenny? I asked. 
feeling confused and overwhelmed. Fuck Jenny, Smilfy yelled, as if to emphasize the point. We heard a reptilian growl. I looked back and saw the reptilian creature running at Jenny. It swiped its clawed fingers at her face. The flesh disintegrated into mutilated stripes. Her left eyeball burst open. Revelets of vitreous fluid dripped down her bloody, torn open cheek as her eyelid hung on by tatters of mutilated skin. Jenny fell back, spattering blood all over the sidewalk and litter-strewn street. Then it turned its cloudy, inhuman eyes towards me and Smuffy. Waves of adrenaline coursed through my body. Panicked, I started sprinting, following closely behind Smuffy. The hard pounding of our sneakers against the concrete echoed through the empty slum. The much softer padding of the lizard's steps drew closer, but I did dare look back. With every smack of a shoe against concrete, I would see the colors of the sound, a sharp and panicked shade of red. Even in my mortal terror, the acid continued to shift gears on me. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of deja vu, as if this had all happened the exact same way an infinite number of times before. In front of me, Smilfi's foot caught on a sidewalk curb as he sprinted for his life, as if in slow motion. I saw his body fly forwards, his mouth a great o of surprise. I glanced back, seeing the lizard creature only a few feet behind us, reaching into my pocket. I pulled out my folding knife, flicking it open. It felt like a paltry piece of nothing in my hand, but if I was going to die, I was going to try to take this fucker with me. Come on, I screamed, a sudden feeling of calm and peace coming over me. I was ready, come on, fucker and it most certainly did. In a blur it ran at me, swiping at my head with its clawed hand I ducked, trying to stab it into the center of its chest. The blade hit it with a sound like metal striking concrete. The hard scales and bones were too much, though, and the knife didn't penetrate. I saw a superficial slash across its alien flesh. Smilfy had gotten up. He also had a knife, as always. He came up behind the creature and shoved the knife into the center of its face. It stuck into its nose holes, a waterfall of blood gushing out. It gave a mechanical, ear-splitting shriek, pulling its head back. Smilfy's knife came with it. Fury slitted its eyes as it spun and tackled Smilfy in horror. I watched its claws come down again and again on Smilfy's chest, neck and face. I ran towards the abomination and jumped at it, tackling it to the ground. We wrestled for a few seconds, but it felt like wrestling a snake. Its body moved in in human ways, and it seemed to slither out of my grasp. Its warm blood covered my body before it quickly crawled away, using its claws to slide its scaly belly across the pavement. It jumped up to its feet in a single motion. I heard Smilfy's choked, bubbling breathing from nearby, and I knew he was severely hurt or dying. On the ground, I started to back away. The creature loomed, over me like the angel of death. It seemed to give a sadistic smile as it raised its hand to deliver the killing blow. I saw a flash of light and heard the roaring of an engine. The creature's eyes widened for a moment as its head spawned to face the new rival. In a blur, Jenna's car smashed into the reptile. Its body smashed hard against the hood as she continued to accelerate into the brick wall of a factory with an explosion of tortured metal and collapsing bricks. She crushed the creature between her car and the factory. She fell out of the car, stumbling to the right and theft before stopping to vomit blood on the ground. Her one good eye met mine for a moment. 
the entire front of her shirt and pants had become a mask of fresh blood. She tried to say something and then collapsed. The lower half of the lizard's body had been crushed between the car's hood and the building. It continued to swipe its claws at air, growling and screaming in an ear-splitting cacophony. But over a few seconds, its movements slowed down and its shrieking became more and more muted. Finally, with a gurgling grunt, it fell forward and did not move any more. Later that day, I checked out Janice Huber profile. She had five stars, all superb ratings from people who had driven with her. Sighing, I decided to also give her five stars. It might have been a far-out Uber ride, after all, but it was certainly a night to remember. Story 5. If the Uber you get in seems strange, trust your gut. I pulled the mask over my nose, pausing my music as the car pulled alongside the curb outside my apartment. Kicking up a spray of filthy snow, the plow's head piled along the streets. It was a red sedan with a slight tent to the windows and one of those dancing hula ornaments at the center of its dashboard, similar to the one displayed on my screen. I shuddered, muttering in irritation at the flecks of muddy snow that now dotted my jeans. Stepping gingerly through the mound as I rounded the back of the car, I knew better than to enter the vehicle without confirming first. I'd heard the horror stories about women getting into the wrong Uber or Lyft and finding themselves stuck in a car with some mania, and I'd made a practice of always checking before I got in. I squinted, glancing between the rideshare app open on my phone and the license plate beneath the trunk. Under the light of the singular street lamp on this side of the street, confirming that they were in fact the same, red rust spilled from the bottom of the trunk, flakes of it staining the top of the plate. A breeze sent another icy chill down my spine, and I hurried to open the back door opposite the driver's side as I slid into the vehicle. I, I huffed with exertion, doing my best to kick some of the clinging snow from my boot as I entered. Jonathan, I decided I'd clean them as best as I could, and turned, bringing my legs into the car as I sat upright, turning my full attention to the driver. For the first time, he nodded, his long greasy hair bobbing across his shoulders with the motion. He watched me for a moment in the rearview mirror, and I couldn't help but stir, something about the odd look in his eyes making me slightly uncomfortable. Even with the mask covering half of his face, a stained surgical mask that looked like it had been in use since the start of the pandemic there was something hollow, yet strangely sinister in his vacant stare. For a moment, I considered thinking up some excuse to go back inside and call another ride, but a quick glance at the time made me realize I was already going to be late. My boss was an asshole, and I'd had a string of late starts throughout the years since my car had died on me. I really couldn't make this worse. I took in a breath, clutching the pepper spray on my keys for affirmation as I closed the door. My eyes watered as the smell of the car hit my nose, and I almost climbed out from that alone. I was sure the man must have noticed my reaction as he watched in the rear view, but I didn't care as I was more focused on not audibly gagging. It smelled like a public toilet, and I couldn't understand how or why he would even let someone in his car like this. In an instant, he pulled the car forward onto the road leading out of town towards my job. I work as a bartender at a local dive bar, strip club on the outskirts of town, fifteen minutes from my house. I had a car, or did before I got into an accident during the pandemic, and with slow work, it had been a struggle to save for repairs. 
So for the time being, it was rideshare apps and awkward conversations. I fought the urge to get comfortable and settle and to scroll social media or listen to a podcast. My cell service was spotty in these areas as it was, and I was quickly running out of data for the month. So any streaming was out of the question. Hell, even trying to follow the progress of my ride on the app was all but impossible with my phone. The image of the car usually frozen. On the last road there was internet. Besides, something about the man demanded I keep my guard raised. A strange sense of disquiet seated in me at the sight of him, and I prayed for the seconds to tick by faster. I watched his phone, trying my best, though likely falling short of stealth, as I tried to make sure he didn't veer from the path. As I watched his screen, glancing down at my phone every few seconds to try and appear less nervous. Every so often I'd get that odd pen and needle sensation at the back of my neck. The feeling that I was being watched and from my peripheral, I was certain I could see him watching me intently through the rearview mirror, only for me to glance up and find his attention focused on the road ahead. Despite my best attempt, I couldn't get past the smell it reeked, and I couldn't understand how Jonathan wasn't reacting. I was trying to work up the courage to ask him to roll down a window without coming off as rude. When he suddenly spoke, his voice was low and raspy as he read the name of my bar aloud. What are you doing somewhere like that at a time like this? He asked, the question devoid of any semblance of genuine worry. It's late, almost midnight, he tapped the time on the dashboard. Someone waiting for you. The question sent a chill down my back, and I could feel my hackles raise at his probing nature. Yes, my boyfriend, I answered, far too quickly. I thanked God for the mask, certain that without it he could see the lie in my face, even with it. I wasn't sure he couldn't as he peered through the rearview mirror. I glanced out the window to my sigh. We were on the freeway nearing my job, about ten minutes away, empty road and trees speeding past. I could ask him to let me out, but hat was its own frightening prospect, and the fact that the road was all but empty at this late hour made the idea even more uncomfortable. I held back a sigh. We were getting closer to my job and he seemed to be sticking to the GPS. I clutched the pepper spray for assurance and resolve that I could make it through the rest of the drive. It's not like I hadn't had a creepy driver or two before, but I'd always made it to my destination safely. There hadn't been anything yet to tell me Jonathan wasn't anything more than your average run-of-the-mill creep. I was sure I could handle ten more minutes of uneasiness rather than being stranded on the side of the road at night. Still, his question and my sudden answer had put me on edge and an idea occurred to me. I scrolled through my contacts until I found Tyrell, my co-worker, and the nighttime security at the bar. He was the closest thing to a friend I had and a tall, imposing veteran. The phone rang once, twice, several times as I pleaded mentally for an answer. Hey, this is Tyrell. My heart leaped. Hey, Ty, I'm sorry I missed your call. Leave a message and I'll try to get back to you. It plummeted in the following instant. Though his eyes stayed on the road, I could almost feel that the man's attention was fully on me. I'm on the way I tried to continue seamlessly, stumbling along my words despite myself as I spoke. I'll need some help taking that stuff inside from the back, so if you could come out to help me that would be great. 
I paused, my heart in my throat as we watched each other in the mirror. The air buzzed with palpable tension, and it suddenly felt very suffocating under the mask as I tried to breathe normally. That stench god, where was it coming from? It clung to the air, assaulting my senses with every breath, and my eyes watered. Oh, okay, bye. I muttered into the phone, realizing I was supposed to be on a call. I'd been so distracted, my attention had strayed from both the road and Jonathan's phone. I hardly realized that we'd veered off my recognized path at some point, apparently turning down one of the many off-roads along the way. I could see the icon on his screen freeze as the app recalculated the route, finding a new path to my job, which he ignored, continuing forward. Uh, I think you should have stayed on the interstate. It's the quickest way and my boyfriend's already expecting me so. Jonathan chuckled to himself. It's a shortcut, he murmured. Then, with a click, he turned off the screen of his phone, grabbing it off of its mount at the center of the dashboard, sliding it into his coat pocket beneath something else. My heart plummeted as though I were in free fall. He laughed to himself as though he'd told some inside joke, and with a feigned, odd sort of leisure began drumming along the steering wheel with his fingers, humming off-key loudly. My head spun, a sense of surrealism buzzing in the air as my stomach dropped watching the screen of his phone go black. I could check our progress from the app. I knew that much, but something told me it wasn't necessary. Everything about the way he'd set it and the fact that he'd turned off the phone told me that he wasn't heading for the bar. I glanced down at the phone trying desperately to appear unfazed, though I was sure my heartbeat must have been audible over the silence in the car and the faint crunch of gravel roads under the tires. As I watched our car fear further from any recognized path to my job. A light bulb went off as I noticed something from the corner of my eye. The image of the driver, Jonathan. I took in a sharp breath. I hadn't paid close enough attention. I checked the license plate. I always checked the license plate, but that wasn't enough. In my haste, I'd neglected to actually check that the driver on the app was the one sitting in the front seat. Staring down at the screen, my hands began to shake, no matter how hard I tried to stop it. As a cold dread began to wash through me, my eyes moved slowly from my phone to the man in the front seat, and to my horror, I could see that he was still glancing up in the mirror back at me. It wasn't the right driver, the man on my screen, Jonathan, was a kindly-looking older gentleman old enough to be my grandfather, with tan skin and short gray hair cut neat. A far cry from the shifty, strange character I was now alone in the car with. My mind raced as my heartbeat painfully thudded against the inside of my chest. I wanted to call the police, but the idea scared me for the same reason asking him to stop had earlier. Escalation I got the distinct feeling the man was unwell and likely dangerous. He could respond to my attempts to call with more immediate violence. Fuck, I wanted to throw up. I'd listened to a true crime podcast or two in my day, and it was beginning to feel more and more like I was being featured in one. I could almost hear them narrating my demise, describing with a practiced, spooky voice how I'd been distracted and wandered into a nightmarish last ride. My thoughts were plagued by all the things I hadn't done, whether it was because I put them off till some nebulous future date or just couldn't because of life. There was so much I wanted to do. I was so caught up in horrible fantasy. I was slow to realize that the car was slowing down, pulling near the side of the unmarked road. 
The thudding in my chest intensified violently as I saw his eyes in the mirror and found a look of predatory glee glistening in them. I, what, where are we? I bit my tongue furiously at how feeble I sounded in the moment, the fear audible in my voice as I stumble over my words. The silence in the car felt suffocating, paired with that smell god what was that, between the sheer terror I felt and the disgust that horde stench brewed in me. I wasn't sure if I was going to vomit or pass out. It was like the reek of feces and blood and... I didn't know how I'd missed it before the smell of blood, clear as day now that I noticed it, was present amongst that unfamiliar stench. Animal panic lurched forth in me a foreboding sense that something bad had happened in this car, likely very recently twisting my stomach into knots. Why are you stopping? I asked, doing my best to sound firm in my question. He laughed trying to conceal it by halfway stifling it into a fake coughing fit. But uh, there's something I have to show you. Look, he ushered for me to move nearer, pointing in the distance at something I couldn't see from the back seat, ushering for me to lean into the front of the car with him. It's right there I'm just dot dot showing people. Just look, come over here so you can see. A nauseating shudder raised the hairs along my back. He motioned again for me to move closer, indicating the space on the console beside him right within arm's reach. I, I can see it from here. I lie, unable to make out whatever in the trees he was pointing to, unwilling to take my eyes off of him for long. He sighed and muttered something, giggling to himself again, like he was telling some wonderful joke. Come look, it'll be quick, then I'll get you right back to work. I didn't know what to do. Something made me feel like outright rejecting his invitation might lead things to spiral even quicker. But I was not about to leave the little safety the car offered at his request to follow this creep into the woods. Any doubt that he intended something awful had all but disappeared with his unwillingness to listen when I was clearly freaked out. The sick fuck was enjoying this. I, I think I see it fine here really, I said, working at my seat belt with one hand, opening the phone app to dial 911 with the other. Thankful he was still giggling to himself staring out at the dark road ahead. Nah, I think you should really step outside. I can help you if you'd like. He turned to face me, and in his eyes, I saw nothing but venom and glee that was predatory and snake-like. I could have passed out from the sheer tidal wave of emotion that struck dread and adrenaline battling for dominance as they seared through my veins. My eyes watered. God, I wanted them not to, but I couldn't help it, and I saw even beneath the filthy mask his smile widen, eyes thinning with humor. He turned back round, sliding a hand into the pocket of his large jacket as he placed the other on the handle of his door. In my head I could see myself dying a thousand awful ways, dragged out to live the quick, violent end of my life in some fucking forest. I could almost see myself laying there, the life gone from my eyes as I grew frigid with the night, at the mercy of the elements of nature, and decay, until some poor asshole found me, from the murky fog of horror clinging to me, perhaps spurred by that thought, came an idea, it probably was a good one and I could immediately picture the many ways it may only expedite my death, but it was an idea and nonetheless I could fight, but I doubted I would win. I could use my pepper spray, but then what? Unless I could overpower him enough to get him out of the car, I'd be running down some MP road waiting for police, and I was pretty sure he'd recover and get to me long before they could. It was risky, 
But this, if it were, could offer me an escape from the waking nightmare I was in. Yeah, oh, okay, sounds cool. I try to sound convincingly interested, failing even to myself. As I grabbed the handle of the door, I swallowed, feeling almost nauseous from anxiety as he watched me through the mirror. Eyes narrowed. Still, it appeared my answer was enough for him. I guess whether it was genuine or not, we both knew I had no other choice. Muttering a silent prayer for the first time in years, I pulled open the door. Stepping out of the car, I engaged the door lock, then closed it behind me, the sound ringing with a potential finality. The night air had a bite to it, frigid with the stubborn breeze that sent pens and needles through me. I had to be quick. I stepped away from the door, moving forward nearer the passenger's side, glancing out in the direction head pointed. Confirming my suspicion, there was nothing out there, nothing but trees and more trees. I heard the driver's side door open and shut behind me and turned to see him rounding the car. He was tall taller than I'd expected from his sitting position, his legs casting long shadows as he passed the car's headlights. My heart pounded, and for a moment my body seemed to lag before some animal. Part of me screamed to move. Adrenaline sprang me forth. I gripped the handle of the door, pulling it open as quickly as I could move, and throwing myself inside. I shot a quick glance out the windshield and saw him freeze, then stop, slamming both hands on the hood of the car with a thud and a look of fury in his eyes made worse by the shadow the headlights cast. As he did, something in his hand caught the light, casting a glint. He had a knife, a long blade fit for some sort of butcher, already used by the looks of it. Get the fuck out of the car, you fucking bitch. I'm gonna fucking get you if you don't open this door. He cried out, a sound much like a furious animal, and hurried to the passenger side door. I locked the door as quickly as I could move, recoiling quickly away from the window as he slammed his fist against the glass, which cracked slightly where the hilt of the blade made contact. I screamed, a sound almost unfamiliar from my own mouth as he slammed his fists into the window again in a rage. He stared at me, eyes almost bulging out of his head with anger, veins visible on his pale neck, then glanced at the door ID just come out of quickly tearing at the handle. I had locked it, the feeling of relief at my foresight was like sob on an open wound, only to be replaced as I watched him begin to round the back of the car. I hadn't locked the other door. Fuck. No, no, I cry, my voice raw with pure panic and defiance. I crawled over the center console, slamming my leg painfully against it in the process as I dove desperately for the power door lock on the driver's side. Our hands made contact at the same time is on the handle, mine on the button. The split-second difference in the time it takes to pull a handle versus push a button, the difference between life and death, the doors locked with a satisfying click, and I turned to see the man who washed Joe and Athens' eyes widened with a look of fury, shock, and worry. He reared back and kicked the driver's side window with enough force that his leg made it through. The bottom of his boot barely an inch from my face, but didn't manage to fully shatter it. He strained for a moment to pull his leg free, muttering a string of expletives and threats at me. As he pulled against the glass which tore the legs of his stained jeans and drew nauseating amounts of blood in the process, shock held me in place for a moment as I tried to blink myself back into action. My eyes fell on the keys, 
still in the ignition, and I glanced back at the man trying to pry his leg from the window. He watched me with hate in his eyes, gripping the stained blade in his hand with white knuckles. I'm gonna fucking kill you, Tracy. It shook me somehow more than anything to hear him say my name, and I wondered for a few horrifying moments how he had before I realized he had access to the app, had been on Jonathan's phone and would have seen the passenger's name. He groaned with exertion as he pulled, freeing his leg to the angle. I'm gonna reach in that car and slice you like I had heard enough. Here, let me help you. I pulled the car from park to drive and hit the gas. No, stop. Fucking his words were cut off as the car picked up speed. There was a sickening crunch and a spray of blood and broken glass as most of the window gave way and the man's leg met the car's frame at devastating speed. His roar of pain was just barely audible over the roar of the engine as I sped down the gravel path. I hit the brakes a few hundred feet up, glancing down at the map on the rideshare app still open on my phone. The road was a dead end I would have to turn around. I maneuvered the car around as quickly as I could manage, desperate not to pull off into a ditch. The headlights illuminated the road, and I peered out expecting to see the man in pursuit, dragging himself forward if need be blade in hand. But the road was empty. There was nothing to even indicate had ever been there at all but a pile of glass in the road and some blood. Fuck this, I breathed, still practically hyperventilating with panic, and I hit the gas. The road was dark, illuminated only by the light from the car, but I didn't slow down until I was on the main road, frightened as though somehow I was sure the man would follow me on foot no matter how unlikely that now was. The roar of the engine faded into the general chaos of my thoughts the sounds around me seeming to echo as I stared out at the road ahead, laughing and crying to myself. I'm sure I would have looked like a maniac to anyone who saw me, but the road was mostly empty. I began to shake as the adrenaline started to fade, my stomach rumbling ominously with the sudden nausea I felt as reality set in. I had almost died tonight. I eased my foot on the gas, realizing I was nearing 100, and fumbled for my phone dialing 911. While talking to the dispatcher and filling her in on my experience as best I could in my state, I got a call back from Tyrell, followed by a long string of texts asking if I was okay. Apparently ID sounded as scared in the voicemails as ID felt and it sent a strange chill down my back knowing that man had heard me like that. My breath came quick and heavy, and I almost gagged yet again at that putrid reek, rolling down all of the other windows to try and clear the car of it. I.D. almost thought it was coming from the fake driver, but now that he was gone I was sure there must be something else. Morbid curiosity began to rise with something like awful realization. I'd e finished with the dispatcher by the time I pulled into the parking lot of the bar. Shed sent out a few officers, some to come meet me at the bar, get my statement, and pick up the vehicle and others to the area I'd e escape from in search of the man I'd e described. Tyrell stood outside holding his jacket close round his neck. His demeanor shifted immediately upon seeing me and the car. The window shattered and blood staining the glass and streaking the door. I'm sure I didn't look much better than I felt. What the fuck happened to you? He asked, sounding both shocked and genuinely worried as I brought the car to a park in the middle of the lot not bothering to find a space for it. I got out, grabbing the keys as I did, 
and rounding the back of the car, he followed me, concern and curiosity lining his face as I made my way to the trunk. My eyes watered, I was right. The smell hit me strongest standing right outside the trunk, and I saw Tyrell's face screw in disgust. What the fuck is in there? He asked, coughing for a few seconds as though he might puke, only to spit. Something bad, I think. I'm pretty sure I was going to be in there. He gave me a look that was unreadable, and I did all for an explanation, a new sort of horror bubbling within me with realization. I slide the key into the lock of the old car's trunk, turning it with a click, swallowing hard against the lump rising in my throat. I opened the trunk. The air that rushed forth was warm and moist and rancid, like an oven filled with decaying meat. I staggered back, blinking wildly against the watering of my eyes. Oh my God, Tyrell breathed. Oh my fucking God. I wiped the moisture from my eyes and looked into the trunk. My mouth fell open and my stomach flipped as I saw it. Stuffed into the back of the car were the remains of Jonathan, the actual Jonathan, a wad picture ID seen on the app. His face was a chalky white, mouth agape in a permanent expression of horror, and where there should have been eyes, instead were to empty pits. A long gash reached from the bottom of his chin to his groin, splitting him down, the middle spreading all manner of contents throughout the inside of the trunk, made worse given the awkward position in which he had been made to fit. Random cuts lined his graying skin, odd fingers or toes missing from his hands and feet. My heart hurt for the man that I'd never known, his last moments having been filled with nothing but the needless cruelty of a maniac, and a part of me mourned for the version of myself that didn't escape, as selfish as it may sound. Looking at the man felt like looking at a potential version of myself, jarring in more ways than I'd expected, and I quickly closed the trunk of the car again. I shut my eyes and held my mouth close, swallowing hard against the rising bile I felt, and turned to Tyrell. Let's go inside. Cops will be here soon to get my statement, and I, I need a fucking drink. He nodded eyes, still wide, casting another glance at the trunk before leading me inside. The cops showed up not too long after, though by then I was already a bit buzzed. Sue me, I.D. survived an attempted murder, and there was much more information I could give that I hadn't already. I spent that night at my sister's house, my boss offering me the rare night off due to my vent, as he called it, and Ty offered me a ride as I was in no mood to call an Uber taxi or anything of the sort. The following days went by in something of a surreal blur. I took call after call from friends, acquaintances, people I met once at a party and the like all feigning concern in an attempt to hear the story from me. At some point I returned home, feeling self-conscious about burdening my sister and her husband, and returned to my apartment. Between all the gossip-seeking calls came the one call I was waiting for. It was from a detective Howard at the local police department, the man in charge of my case. I'd been cleared of any suspected involvement almost immediately, as the body of Jonathan Derry as I'd come to learn his name, was several hours old by the time I'd stepped into the vehicle and his car had been taken hours away from the city he lived and most commonly drove in all the way to our little town, likely by the men I'd been in the car with that night. They didn't have any clue as to the man's identity as by the time officers had arrived. There was no trace of him besides his blood in the pool of glass, and my description of a guy with greasy long hair would only be so helpful. 
given a person on the run is likely to change their appearance, a haircut usually being the first solution. He told me that they were keeping an ear out at any local hospitals for a man of his description with an injury to the leg like the one I.D. likely caused him and told me I.D. be kept updated on their progress. You survived something most people probably wouldn't, he said as the call drew to a close. Count yourself lucky, I guess, thanks. No problem, get some rest if you've got any questions. It occurred to me instantly, like a random light flickering to light amongst the darkness. I wasn't even sure why. Did you find the phone, the driver's, Jonathan's, it was like pulling at a string and unraveling more and more frightening realizations. The phone had had my address, my name, and phone number on it. I.D. never finished the rye, so there was no way to be sure how long he'd seen my address. Even if he hadn't, he'd seen where I lived. No, no phone. They're looking into it, though. What if he comes back? He knows where I live, where I work. What if he comes back? The words left my mouth almost mechanically, my breath catching in my throat as a familiar anxiety returned. Th, then you call us, that's not likely to happen. We've got no reason to believe he stayed in the area. You're safe, he didn't sound convincing. Again, if anything happens, call us. Okay, thanks, I couldn't think of anything else to say, as the call clicked to an end. The last few days have been passable. Ty has offered to drive me to and from work which is fine for the time being. But I live out of his way, and I don't want to impede for much longer. There's been no sign of that man. Outside of the recurring nightmares riddling my restless sleep each night, but every time I see an unfamiliar car slow down outside my building, my heart stops, which is all too often in an apartment complex. That's why I'm writing this. It's both a warning and an attempt to get this shit out of my mind, so maybe leaving it here will help. That man, whoever he is, is still out there, and I'm sure there are others like him. If you use ride-sharing apps, Uber, Lyft, hell even taxis, and the driver ever makes you feel uneasy in the slightest, trust your gut. It's better than what the alternative could be what it could have been for me. It's better than living a life looking over your shoulder.